Hello, I'm John Garvin. Welcome to another episode in my series on oil painting. Today I'm going to be tackling one of my favorite subjects, the Deschutes River, which is the main river that flows through the high desert just a couple of miles from my house. I've been painting it for a few years now. Uh, in fact, it was the first painting that I did as one of my small landscapes. This painting, which I still own, um, is called Fall at Farewell Bend, and it was the third painting I did in 2012. This was a speed painting, which I completed in just over an hour. Since then, I've slowed down a little bit, and I'm using some different underpainting techniques to try to, to try to just capture a little more fidelity and a little more color in the, in the landscapes. Today, in fact, I want to show you a new technique that I've learned just for this painting. As always, I work for my own photographs. I took this one along the Deschutes River Trail, just north of Farewell Bend Park. I do most of my composition work in the camera, but in this case, I decided that the clear blue sky wasn't doing it for me. Luckily, after more than two decades in the video game industry, I've developed some Photoshop skills, so I'm able to edit this pretty easily. I just have to find another photo with a cloudscape that I like, then cut and paste it into my target image. Now my painting will have a cloudscape that will add a lot more interest. Next, I set the image to grayscale and print it out using my inexpensive desktop printer. Then I take the printout and trim it to size. This is printed at the exact same size as my final sheet of masonite, 8 inches by 6 inches, making transferring the image super easy. Using graphite paper and a red pencil so I can see which parts of the image I've already done, I draw quickly and with lots of energy. As I've mentioned before, the goal here is not to create an accurate copy of the photo, but to capture its broad shapes and forms. I know most artists do not do it this way, but instead sketch directly on the masonite or their canvas using paint or charcoal. For me, I developed this technique when doing my more photorealistic portraits and cartoon paintings. And I still feel it gives me the best of both worlds, an impressionistic drawing grounded in the perspective and shapes of the real world. Once the drawing is transferred, I seal the painting surface with a thin coat of Damar retouch varnish. This will keep the first layers of oil paint from washing away the drawing's thin lines. When the surface is completely dry, I set it up on my easel and I'm ready to start the underpainting. The goal of the underpainting is to create a loosely rendered value study that establishes all of the lights and darks for the scene. My palette for this is pretty simple. Titanium white, Payne's gray, and two or three shades of Portland gray. Using the grayscale photo as a guide, I start with the river surface and just start painting, working from light to dark. Then I jump up to the mid-ground trees, again working from light to dark, and then just start working the entire surface of the painting. Note how I'm not worried about detail here at all. I just want to capture broad forms and large areas of light and shadow. I go over the entire surface, adding small details here and there, knowing that they will shine through the final layers of color that I'll add next. And it's done. Again, I know that not a lot of artists will do a full underpainting, but I find that it provides a tremendous base for the final color version of the painting, keeping my values realistic and consistent, making the shadow areas richer, the colors deeper, and the highlights just pop off the surface of the masonite. So once the underpainting is completely dry, I'm ready to start painting. And this is where that new technique I mentioned comes into play. This is something that I learned from Roger Bansomer, who is a East Coast painter, mostly doing landscapes and seascapes. Uh, and he and his wife, Sarah, travel the United States and the world, really, painting, doing plein air paintings, going back to their studio, finishing them, and, uh, and selling them in galleries all over the country. So he has a show on public broadcasting, you can probably find it on your local channel, called uh, Traveling and Painting um, with Roger and Sarah Bansomer. 
And uh, I happened to catch an episode of his show one Sunday, and it was this little plein air painting that he was doing, um, and it it was it was really 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 well done. So the thing I learned from him was limiting your palette. So I've got the three colors. They're not exactly the three that he recommended, but they're um, they're pretty close. And what he recommends is just using three primary colors um, and limiting your palette to that because you can mix all your secondaries all your tertiaries you can gray them all down with just these three colors and you're going to be absolutely sure that your painting harmonizes because you're just limiting it to these so i've got french ultramarine blue um alizarin crimson and uh cadmium yellow medium and again these are very very different kinds of shades of the three primary colors but you can make any color you want just from these so let's get started so at first it seemed a little daunting to not have my palette filled with color. I think I have something like over a hundred different tubes of paint in every imaginable hue. But I'm excited to see what I can do with just these three colors. I want to work from light to dark, so I start by mixing some of the cad yellow with a tiny amount of the Allures and Crimson to give me a rich gold color. I'm mixing the paint with a lot of medium here, so it goes on in thin layers. I use my own custom medium of stand oil, terps, and varnish, which will give the final painting a rich glossy look. And again, I paint very quickly and loosely. A lot of the detail is provided by the underpainting, so I'm basically glazing over the top of it, moving quickly around the surface, not worrying too much about specific details. Adding a little French marine blue, I now switch to darker masses of leaves and pine needles on the trees. The brushes and shrubs on the shoreline and more details on the trees. As I push back into the distance, I gray the colors down a little using more alizarin crimson so they won't be so intense. This will add atmosphere and depth to the final painting. Next, I make alizarin crimson and blue with a little yellow to give me this rich earth tone, which I use to add shadow to the shrubs and detail to the reflections in the water. This is an area where I'm lucky to remember at least a little about how the river looked while I was there taking the photo. Seldom is the river surface completely blue as it reflects everything around it, including the trees, the shrubs, and the sky. Now I mix a little white with some of the other yellows and grays that I've already mixed and work on the sky. This is where I begin to really define the trees, painting in negative spaces inside the tree masses and refining the outward shapes. I also work on the background trees, changing their shapes and sizes so they're not all the same size, and using gray to push some of them back even further. Then back to the sky, painting in more negative spaces, bits of cloud showing through the masses of needles, and clumps of leaves here and there. One of the more pleasant surprises I have working with this limited palette is how rich the colors really are. To get this brown for the tree trunks, I again use the same mix of alizarin crimson and cad yellow, and with a touch of blue, was able to get this amazingly deep brown. Normally, I would have used a burnt sienna for this, but I find this simple mixture of colors to provide a more lively brown that, yes, harmonizes with the rest of the palette. It's at this stage that I begin to pay attention to details. Mixing in more cad yellow, I paint in the highlights on the trunks, where the sunlight is at its brightest and start adding some reflection details in the water. I use that same warm gold to add details to the shrubs and trees. For additional highlights, I go back to my palette and mix in more titanium white and less medium. This will make the paint more opaque, which will help me add detail over existing layers of paint. I use it to refine details in the background rocks, the cliff walls behind the trees here to the left, and most importantly, all the little branches, twigs, and dead brush that will make this painting come to life. Using a new double op brush, I go in and I add highlights to the tree trunks, as well as all of these sweeping branches. Then I come in and add details to the shrubs and bushes, just tiny bits of color here and there where the sun is catching a leaf. Another thing I really like about this limited palette is I would never have thought to use alizarin crimson for my deep shadows. I would have probably gone with burnt umber, which is a dead color compared to this deep red. 
Now, at this point, I'm just working all over the painting, adding dots of shadow here and there. Mixing in a little blue, I go in and add shadow details along the riverbank, beneath the shrubs, inside the tree masses, refining the shapes of branches, giving the trees more form and depth. At this point, I'm convinced this limited palette technique is going to work. So I turn my attention to the foreground grasses on the lower left. These are a challenge to paint because I couldn't really define them in the underpainting. I knew I wanted the water to be laid in first so that the blades of grass would blend in smoothly, so there's no real point to doing them in grayscale. That means I have to make this up as I go. Working from dark to light, as always, I start by painting in some really crude shadow areas as background, just trying to define the overall placement and shapes of these clumps of grass. While I'm there, I grab a little more of my brown mixture and refine the reflections in the water, so I'll have fresh paint to work with for all the grass that I'm going to paint right over the top. Then I grab some yellow and start working in highlights. Brighter for the top area near the grass, darker towards the bottom where the grass is in shadow. All it takes is a few well-painted strokes to convince the eye that this is grass. This bent blade grass technique is one that I learned from Karl Barks doing my Disney paintings but it's pretty common among all landscape painters. Once I get the grass done to the point where I know it's going to work, I leave it to dry and start working on refining the entire painting. In many ways, this is the most fun and satisfying part of the entire process. The painting is completed enough that I know it's going to be successful, and now I can have fun making it better and better. This means adding details to the cliffs and trees, spots of color to the background, refining more shadow areas, spotting in more darks. Also, I go in and add ripples to the river, reflections along the banks, more detail to the sky and clouds, highlights to the river in the foreground, and background. Then I tackle the rapids, refining the wave lines and rocks. This is another example of detail work that I leave to the very end, knowing I can easily refine these once the river is more complete. The last thing I work on are the trees to the right. Because these are farther away, I don't want to add as much detail to them. No visible snags or branches, for example. But I just focus on the masses of highlights and shadows. Finally, I mix a little white into my blue and add a touch of alizarin crimson to create a somber purple color, which I can use to add more volume and depth to my clouds. This may not be exactly what I see in the photo, but I use every opportunity I can to add more color to a landscape, which will make it less like a photo and more interesting and pleasing to the eye. And as always, the last thing I add is my signature. I try to mix a color that will stand out, but not be obnoxiously visible, and paint it into the lower right corner in a spot I deliberately kept free of detail, knowing that this is where it was going to go. And with that, this painting is done. From beginning to end, it took just over five and a half hours to complete, so a little more time than that first speed painting I did. But I'm really happy with how this one turned out. I learned a new technique, and this limited palette is something that I'm probably going to keep using in the future. Once the painting's completely dried, I varnish it and then frame it. I try to keep the frame really, really simple because there's so much detail in the painting itself that when you hang it on the wall, you want the painting to pop. All right, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed it, think about subscribing, hit that like button, and I'll see you next time.